Hello all you crazy people out there, my name is Michael, I like wizards and dragons and making games, and let's talk about outlines. In the past I've made videos on what I like to call fake outlines, which basically boils down to just drawing multiple copies of a sprite or some other um, graphical object slightly offset from each other so that you can see the edges poking out from behind. And that's fine, in a lot of cases that's all you need, that'll work, you don't have to do any more work than that. But if you want, you can also go the image processing route, and that means using a shader. Everything on this channel seems to boil down to shaders, doesn't it? So to give you a little preview of what is to come in this video, uh, I have a couple pictures of rabbits here because I like rabbits. First, there's this one, which is just a cartoon black and white um, outline of a rabbit that I grabbed off of a website called The Noun Project. As you can see, it's entirely black and white, and there is a, uh, there is a nice hard cutoff between the, the light background and the dark foreground. Uh, then there's this picture of my actual rabbit with a Photoshop filter passed over it to make it, um, to give it a more posterized look. It has more detail in it. You can see a lot more noise going on in the grass uh, and, in, and in like the fur back here, but uh, there's still only a couple pictures. It's not as busy as the original photograph. And uh, then of course there's the original photograph, which has um, a lot of detail. There's a lot of stuff going around in the grass and his fur and, and the, the rabbit leash. If anybody doesn't know what this is, this is a rabbit leash because people make those and people use them. If you never knew that before this, then well, now you do. So to see this with the outline filter on it, you can see that the um, that the cartoon rabbit with the nice hard cutoff, black and white, has some um, has a very nice outline. It's very sharp. It's very clear. Uh, next up, this is the posterized version of the rabbit, and it's a little bit messier because there is more going on, but you can still generally see the shape of like the rabbit ears and the rabbit eyes and all that, and kind of the leash over here, in the middle, and uh, then the last one. I wouldn't really call this so much of an outline, but it is a very interesting effect, I think. So none of that's actually done in this project. All I have in this project uh, here is a, uh, an object of room, which contains the object, uh, and a couple sprites. There's no shaders or anything like that. Uh, in the object's create event, the different bunny sprites are indexed in an array, and uh, when you go over to the draw event, if you want, you can do this in the step event, but I don't feel like having more code windows open than I need. If you press the left key, it scrolls through the different bunny images, and then it just draws it on the screen. Uh, again, the stuff with the outline was in, a, uh, was in a demo project, which is what we will have by the end of this video. Before I start, standard disclaimer applies. While this video isn't going to be on any 3D effects like I often do, this is not exactly going to be a beginner level shader video. If you are not yet familiar with shaders and the kinds of information that they process and what they do and what a color value is and how vectors work, uh, I am not going to spend a lot of time going over those in this video. I've got an entire playlist of, uh, of other shader videos that I've made in the past which go into more detail about those things. Even if you are watching this video and you're not interested in doing 3D stuff, I do recommend at least watching the first 3D lighting video on directional lights, because in that video I talk about what the dot product is and how it works and what kind of result it produces, and we are going to be using the dot product in this video. All these topics are connected. In addition to that, the uh, the video on textures and how textures work in Game Maker, generally good to know. Let's talk about Sobel filters. So the way this is going to work is with something called a Sobel operator, also sometimes called a Sobel kernel. Kernels are something you'll see in image processing fairly often if you do a lot of that. They sound scarier than they are. All they really boil down to is an array that you use to compare pixels that are next to each other in an image. And indeed, the Sobel operator, the Sobel kernel that we're going to be using um, in this video is just going to be a, um, it's going to be a three by three array of numbers, which we apply to every pixel in the image that we're drawing in the, um, in the fragment shader. If you want some more backstory on these things, uh, the YouTube channel known as Computer File did a video on the Sobel operator uh, a number of years ago. I believe they also did one on, um, on kernels themselves. I'm pretty sure they did. I don't have it. Um, I don't have it open in my browser right here. Uh, I will have links to these things in the video description. In any case, anyway, let me open up uh, one of these images. So if I were to zoom in all the way on one of these images, if I can find an edge, let's try zooming in over here. Uh, if I were to zoom in all the way on one of these images, and uh, also let me turn the grid on, uh, a one by one grid, so you can see each pixel, like this. If you look at this image with your eyes, you can see that there is, a, uh, there is a fairly sharp contrast between the light and the dark parts of this image. Intuitively, most people can understand that. Getting the computer to understand that can be a little bit more work. What the Sabelle operator does is it will pass over each one, of these, um, each one of these pixels. So if you've been watching my videos for a long time, when I mentioned comparing the different color values just now, 
the first thing you probably thought of was the dot product, and indeed we are going to be using the dot product for this. Remember, the dot product is just for um, comparing two vectors and determining how similar they are. Uh, they are often used in 3D lighting when it comes to surface normals and angles of incidence of light rays, but they don't have to be. That's just one of many uses for them. And you can also use them to compare colors and determine how similar two different colors are. Let's zoom out of this and, uh, and write some shader code. So first, let's go and uh, create a shader. I'm just going to call it... That's, that's not a shader, that's a script. I am just going to call it um, shader underscore outline. Nice and easy. Uh, in the draw event where we draw the sprite over here of whatever bunny we have chosen. Let's just say shader set, shader outline when we're finished, shader reset. And uh, this is just going to be right now a, a boring old pass through shader. We can leave the vertex shader alone. We're not going to touch the vertex shader. Uh, the fragment shader looks like this. We're going to be doing most of our work in the fragment shader. If I run the game now, uh, this is going to look exactly as it did before because this is just a pass through fragment shader that takes the input as is and doesn't do anything to it. Firstly, the kernel itself. So I mentioned that a kernel is basically just an array in computer science terms. And the, uh, the Sibel kernel that we're going to be using uh, in this video is going to be a 3x3 three three array. There's actually two of them. There is going to be a separate Sobel kernel for uh, horizontal gradient detection and vertical gradient detection, and we're going to use them both and then put them together. If you watch the computer file video on the Sobel kernel, uh, the guy in the video, Dr. Mike Pound, mentions this. That's okay. Uh, so you can define an array in shader languages. I don't know if I've mentioned this in the past. Uh, you can also use a matrix. This is the kernel. Again, this is what the value in the arrays are going to look like, or at least the horizontal one. The vertical one looks like this. You are also most certainly allowed to represent this as a 3x3 three three matrix, which is what I'm going to do in this video because it's going to make things slightly easier than using a uh, just an array of floats. I don't know if this is going to be too different from anything that I've done in the past and if that's going to confuse people. I am guessing that if you are someone who seeks out videos on subjects like these um, on the internet, it is fair to assume that you are decently math-minded and that you don't mind uh, mathematical concepts like matrices. But if that does turn out to be a problem, uh, let me know. There are a couple of videos I want to make in the future about just numbers and math and vectors and matrices and that kind of thing. And if this turns out to be a problem here, uh, let me know and I will, I will try and get those done sooner rather than later. Anyway. I'm going to define a matrix. Uh, it is not going to be a mat4 like we've used on occasion in the past, but instead a mat3, which is going to be a 3x3 three three matrix. I'm going to give it a name. Let's call it Sobel X. And this is going to be equal to a mat3. And this is a constructor for a matrix, uh, the same way that uh, for a vector3 you could say vec3, just instead of a vector3, which takes three numbers in its constructor like this. Uh, we are going to be creating a 3x3 three three matrix, which takes 3x3 three three equals 9 numbers in its constructor. Those numbers are going to be what you see in order in the uh, Sobel kernel, the horizontal Sobel kernel. Uh, that is going to be 1.0, 2.0, 1.0. Um, three more zeros, and then negative 1.0, negative 2.0, negative 1.0. Putting this all on a single line is kind of confusing. What you're allowed to do instead if it makes it easier to read your own code is uh, break this up into multiple lines. Shader languages don't really care about white space uh, the same way the GML doesn't care about white space, the same way a lot of languages that aren't Python don't care about white space. So if it makes it easier uh, to read your own code by breaking it up into three lines like this, and uh, then you can visualize the three by three matrix uh, in that case, go for it. We're also going to need another one of these for the uh, vertical part of the Sobel filter. And as you have probably noticed, uh, the vertical part of the Sobel filter is just the, uh, the horizontal one transposed. I should probably give an obligatory mention to uh, row major versus column major shader languages. What I'm going to say specifically about row major versus column major is, uh, in this case, don't worry about it because these two operators are going to be combined at the end of the shader. And it doesn't matter if you do one first and then the other, or the other first and then the first, it's going to give you the same answer. Next, after this, um, I am going to define a third 3x3 three three matrix. And that is going to be mat3, I'm just going to call it magnitudes. And instead of uh, assigning this with a constructor, instead of assigning this a value with a constructor, 
Uh, I'm just going to put a semicolon at the end of that line and call it off there. This is going to initialize in a three by three matrix of entirely zeros. Can I, am I allowed to type 0, 0.0 out without seven, eight, nine? Anyway, this is going to initialize a, a three by three matrix of entirely zeros. If you just end the line with a semicolon, that's okay. We're going to fill in the values to this later. We're going to fill in the values at each of the, uh, the positions to this later. If it makes it easier for you, if you prefer, um, I suppose there's no harm in there's no harm in just leaving that there so that it's on the screen and that people can see it. Is my font size big enough? On that note, is my font size big enough? Should I make it bigger? I'll make it a little bit bigger. To me, this font size is fine, but if you're watching this in a YouTube video on the YouTube watch page, then it might be a little bit small. Okay, let's move that line down at the bottom uh, a little bit farther down so that there's space. So let's go over each of these uh, each of these fragments neighbors in a loop. So loops and shaders, if you've never seen them before, they work basically the same way as they do in other computer languages. Uh, for int i equals zero, i is less than three, i plus plus would create a loop that runs three times uh, for the values i equals zero, i equals one, and i equals two. When i reaches three, it just stops because that's the end of the loop. Um, int Again, shader languages are statically typed, so you have to define a data type. You can't just say var uh, the way you would in something like JavaScript or in GameMaker. You need to say int, and um, integers are, are a data type which store numbers. Integers are whole numbers. They don't have a fractional part, so you can't have like 1.5 for an integer. Anyway, uh, that can be for the horizontal. We need to do this again for the vertical for fot for int j equals zero, j is less than three, j plus plus. Loops and shaders are kind of a dangerous thing because of performance reasons. In this case, we're only running a loop three by three times equals nine iterations of, the, of both loops total. So it's not that big of a deal. Shaders are really good at doing simple math really fast. Uh, people occasionally bring up the concern that loops technically have in, like if statements in them. One, don't worry about if statements and shaders. Two, uh, the, the shader compiler will most, most likely optimize this so it won't be a problem. That's a story for another day. So these two for loops, these nested for loops, are running three times, three times. So I said we were going to be getting the, uh, the pixel values of each of the neighbors of the fragment that we're drawing right now. Let's define ourselves a vector two, and we can call that coords or something like that, coordinates, whatever you want. And this is going to be equal to the value of v underscore v text chord. And this is going to be equal to a vector two constructor. Uh, the horizontal component is going to be v underscore v text chord dot x plus i i plus i. Now the values of i and j in these loops range from zero to positive two. And if you want to get each of the neighbors of a fragment, you really want i and j here to range from negative one to positive one. You can set the bounds of the uh, the starting condition and the ending condition of the for loops to something like negative one and positive one or whatever. Uh, or you can just subtract one over here, 1.0. I don't know over here if uh, if I will be automatically converted to a float, if uh, the shader compi compiler will automatically cast it to a float. I don't actually think it does. So uh, to explicitly cast an integer to a float because the computer may or may not automatically do that, uh, we can we can tell it to do that uh, using a using a float constructor over here. And then for the uh, the vertical component of this vector two over here, uh, v, v underscore v text chords dot y uh, plus float j minus 1.0. Once again, and there needs to be a, a closed parentheses there. So if you're used to uh, texture coordinates in shaders and in other places, you may be noticing a problem already, and that is that texture coordinates always range from zero to one. One corner of a, uh, of a texture sampler, the texture coordinates are gonna be zero, zero, and the other corner of the texture sampler, it uh, doesn't matter what size it actually is, the coordinates are gonna be one, one. This is a problem because if you, um, if you simply subtract one or add one or whatever to a texture coordinate in a shader, uh, you are going to get the wrong answer. The exact wrong answer depends on your texture repetition settings, but nevertheless, you're going to get the wrong answer. Some shader languages and the shader language that the version of GLSLES the game maker uses is not one of them. Some shader languages do provide a function which is for getting uh, texture coordinates uh, by exact coordinates uh, rather than relative zero to one. 
So that function is called something to the effect of, and I can't remember exactly, but texture fetch, or maybe it might be texel fetch, something like that. And it would also take a vector two uh, to look up the pixels, except instead of, um, instead of a vector two of floats, it would be a vector two of ints. That should be available in modern versions of, uh, of GLSL, the shader language. But the version that GameMaker uses does not have such a thing. I don't know if HLSL 11 has an equivalent. It probably does. I, uh, I just don't know off the top of my head. So what to do about this? So I've encountered this problem in shader videos before. Uh, way back when, when I did a grayscale image hey. filtering video uh, last year, uh, we ran into a similar problem where we wanted to look up the values of adjacent pixels. The way you would do that would be to divide this value here, um, float of i minus 1.0, by the uh, the width of the uh, of the image of the texture, and same thing over here for uh, the vertical the vertical component of the texture coordinates. To get those, uh, the simplest way is to pass in a uniform. So I'm going to say uniform uh, floats. Nope, uniform vec two. Hey. Text size, and over here in the draw event up here, uh, we can pass in those uniforms. R u text size equals shader get. Uniform. So you get the uniform with the name text size from the shader. And then to actually set that value, shader set uniform f, uh, u text size. And the values can be sprite get width. sprite get width and sprite get height of the sprite that we're drawing. So this is going to bring up a point. Right now, uh, none of these images are on their own texture pages. This can make things a little bit weird when you're doing stuff with textures and shaders and vertex buffers and such. Um, I'm going to turn this on. I'm going to turn the separate texture page option on for each of these sprites, each of these images. Normally when you do this, you would want them to be a, a power of two. Uh, right now, these are not. They're not like 64 by 64 or 256 by 256 or anything. Uh, the, the photographs are just 1280 by 720 and the rabbit is 700 by 700. Nine times out of 10, when you use something like an outline shader in a game, you won't be using it on a single sprite. Rather, you'll be using it on something like the application surface or another surface which contains graphical information. And then you won't have to worry about this because surfaces don't really exist on texture pages. Uh, surfaces are really their own texture pages. But just to make things easier, let's just put all of these rabbits on their own texture pages. So we have the texture size. So this is the size of the sprites. And uh, we can, now that we have that, we can simply divide this number by text size.x and as well as the other one, uh, the vertical component divided by text size.y. And now, finally, after all that, we have the coordinates on which we can look up the neighbors of each pixel in the, in the, uh, the texture sampler, or the gm underscore base texture sampler. So we can do that. We can get the texture2d, texture2d of gm underscore base texture. Uh, the coordinates that we're looking up are, instead of the actual v underscore v text chord, we're gonna be looking up the ones that are slightly adjusted uh, for each neighbor. So that's going to be the original text coordinate and the um, each texture coordinate one pixel around it. We don't really need the alpha. Uh, this is going to return a vector four containing a red, a green, a blue, and an alpha channel. We don't really need the alpha. Uh, we just need the red, green, blue. We just, we just need the actual color components. Furthermore, we don't actually need the color of, the, uh, of each pixel itself. If we're going to compare the contrast of uh, pixels to their neighbors, uh, we just need the length of this vector, so red, green, blue color is a three-dimensional vector. And just like a three-dimensional vector which represents a position in space or a direction in space or something, uh, you are allowed to take the length of a, of a red, green, blue three-dimensional vector or any other vector because the computer doesn't actually care if, they, if a vector contains a color or a position or, or some other information like that. So this is the value that we're looking for. Again, this is the relative brightness in the past, I would have obtained brightness information from a pixel by adding up the red, green, and blue color channels and dividing by three. And then at some point, I saw someone just using the length of the uh, three-dimensional red, green, blue vector to get the, um, the relative brightness. And I said, that makes a lot of sense, and it's, and it's a lot less typing than what I was doing before, so let's do that. 
The value that this returns won't be between 0 and 1 the way that averaging the color channels would be. Uh, instead, it'll be something like 0 to 1.7 or whatever the square root of 3 is, but for the, uh, for the purposes of the Sobel filter, it'll be, it'll be good enough. So we need to save this somewhere if we want it to actually be useful to, to anything in the future. And we can just store... You probably guessed this was coming, but we're going to store the magnitude of this vector inside the, uh, the magnitudes array matrix thing. And that's it for the section with the for loops over here. So if you want to, uh, if you want to try to visualize the numbers that will be in this magnitudes um, matrix over here, I will have some graphics on the side of the screen. On the top, you see some colors with their corresponding color values. And below that, you see the numbers that would be in the corresponding 3x3 magnitude matrix, uh, representing each pixel, each fragment, and its neighbors, uh, once you take the length of the red, green, and blue color channels. I hope those graphics are going to be of a little bit of additional help to anyone who wants to try to visualize the numbers that are going to be running through this, um, considering that I have yet to actually run this code yet to see what, um, to see what it does. Next, we haven't actually used Sabel X and Sabel Y yet. We haven't actually used these kernels yet. Um, now that we have figured out the magnitude of each pixel of each of the neighboring pixels, we can, uh, we can compare them to each other. So I'm going to define a float. I'm just going to call it X. This is, going to be, um, this is going to be the result of the horizontal Sobel filter, the horizontal Sobel kernel. And uh, there's going to be a couple dot products here. I'm going to take the dot product of first Sobel x index 0 and magnitudes index 0. This may look a little bit wrong if you think about what data types uh, Sobel x and magnitudes are. Instead of simple arrays, instead of simple one-dimensional arrays, these are 3 by 3 matrices. Something that's a little bit of a useful secret to know about matrices and vectors in shader languages, and just graphics engines in general, is that just the same way a vector 3 is um, 3 floating point values in sequence, uh, a matrix 3 is 3 vector 3s in sequence. And just the same way a, a float 4 is 4 floating point values in sequence, a matrix 4 is, um, is also 4 vector 4s in sequence. If you're familiar with things like the C programming languages and other low-level programming languages, um, it may help to think of these things as a union of different values, uh, which could be represented by either a, a, a just a 2D array of floats or a 1D array of vectors. So this means that if you try to access um, a, a matrix 3 or a matrix 4 with um, double square bracket notation like you would with a two-dimensional array, uh, you will get a floating point value as the result that's at whatever cell you're looking up in the array. And if you were to just try to access a, um, a matrix with a single square bracket as if it was a one-dimensional array, instead of, uh, instead of looking up a, a particular uh, floating point value in that array, you would instead look up an entire row or column of the array as a vector. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Uh, we're taking a, an individual row of the Sibyl kernel, interpreting it as a vector, and then comparing it to, the, um, comparing it to a row of, um, of brightness magnitudes which can be thought of the brightness of that entire row, and using the dot product to see how similar they are. Uh, friendly reminder, as always, the dot product compares two vectors. If two vectors are pointing in the same direction, the dot product is 1. If two vectors are pointing in the opposite direction, the dot product is negative 1. If two vectors are perpendicular, the dot product is 0. In this case, two vectors that are pointing in the same direction may not have a, a dot product of exactly 1 because um, they are not normalized, but uh, soon enough you will see that this will eventually produce the results that we're looking for anyway. So next, uh, we've taken the dot product of Sobel x index 0 and magnitudes index 0. Uh, we would also like to do that with the second index in the, uh, in the, in the matrices, or I guess the, the first if you're indexing from 0. And finally, uh, the last row in the matrix, the last, the last uh, index in the matrices dot. So bell x index 2. This is going to compare the, uh, the horizontal contrast. Um, I can run the game now, and if I were to, instead of uh, setting gl underscore frag color equal to the, um, the color that you actually got on the base texture, uh, you can say gl underscore frag color is going to equal a vector 4 of, let's, let's say, x, 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 and 1.0 on the alpha. And if I were to run the game now, you should see something. I do have the shader set, right? I hope this works on the first try. I haven't been able to screw text cord. 
Okay, this, uh, that variable should not have an S after it. I hope this works on the first try. I haven't run this code in like an hour. Okay, so you can see we've got kind of an outline. Uh, you can see it's not all there. It's only on really one side of this image. It's also doing a very interesting thing to the uh, to the credit line at the bottom of this image. I left that on on purpose. Normally when you use icons from uh, something like the noun project, you would just like write this down so that you can properly credit them when when the time comes. But I, uh, I deliberately left that in on this on this image because I thought it would look cool when I uh, when I tested it. Anyway, this is progress. Uh, we're not there yet though. So we also need to actually use the um, the vertical part of the sub bail filter. I'm going to define another float, call it y, and it's going to be very much the same thing, but instead of instead of using uh, sub bail x as the um, as the first vector that we're using in, in each of the dot products, I'm going to be using uh, sub bail y. And then uh, to combine these two values, as I said we would at the beginning, I, I can delete this line now, can't I? I'm going to define a third float. Uh, showed my hand there a little bit. I'm going to call it final. And uh, we are going to combine these by essentially taking the, um, the Pythagorean theorem, by essentially doing the Pythagorean theorem on x and y. Uh, so the square root of x times x, y times y, and then uh, instead of uh, instead of using x as the as the color channel in float four, we can say uh, final. And oh, hang on, this should be a plus. All right, that, that took a minute to see. So now we have an outline. This is very sharp. Uh, this is what I would consider a like a non-cheating outline. I don't want to call it a proper outline because the strategy I mentioned at the beginning of this video where you just kind of layer sprites on top of each other is still a very valid way to create an outline. In most cases, that's still good enough, but this is a, this is how you would do it with a shader with a Sabelle operator. Um, I have a couple other images in this little in this little demo here. So if I scroll through them, you can see that the, uh, the unimpressed rabbit, uh, this is the posterized version, and you can see the, uh, the lines in the grass and the, uh, the, the original photograph is a lot messier because there's a lot more contrast in that image. There's a lot of, um, instead of a single smooth gradient, instead of a single um, image of a flat color, each, each pixel in the image is slightly different from each of its neighbors because that's just like how light works in real life. If you ever wanted to know what ray tracing and computer graphics was inspired by, well, the answer is real life. So there's a few more things. Uh, one is that in the video, in the computer file video over here, uh, this guy, Dr. Mike Pound, mentions that it's very common to um, to apply Gaussian blur or some other blur over the image before uh, running a Sobel filter on it. And the reason for that is that if I were to do something like just, let's draw a black dot there in the middle. And if I were to zoom out at normal scale, uh, you can more or less see it. It's just a single pixel, but it stands out against its background. Um, if I were to run this with the uh, the Sobel filter running on it, you would, you would definitely see it. It would definitely be picked up by the Sobel filter. Uh, you can see there's a little white dot there. If instead of making that a um, a black dot, if I were to make that something like a very light gray dot and zoom out instead, uh, with your eye, you can't really see that, although it's still there. If you squint, you can you can tell it's there. But if you were to run the Sobel filter on this, uh, you would definitely still see it. It would definitely still pick it up. Uh, you can see this is for identifying contrast. This Sobel filter is for identifying contrast in an image. And as slight as it might be, uh, that little bit of contrast is definitely still picked up there. And uh, among other things, that is what causes something like um, this picture of the bunny with the posterized filter on it to reduce the amount of colors uh, to still have a lot of jagged edges because even the very small variations in, in um, difference in color are kind of magnified by the Sobel filter. And then when it comes to the original, you can just like completely forget it because um, Every pixel in this, in this image is slightly different from its neighbor, and that causes basically this uh, this filter to go haywire. I will say this doesn't really look great as an outline detection filter, uh, an, an outline detection shader, but you can use something like this in your game to give it like a sketched sort of like a, a pencil stylized uh, look. If you're uh, if you're feeling that, if you're feeling that kind of art direction. All right, God. Now I'm thinking of all the other Photoshop filters that exist and um, thinking how much fun it might be to, to write shaders for many of these other filters. 
but that's a that's a that's a subject for another day. Anyway, if you were to blur this slightly, does Game Maker have a built-in blur? <clears throat> does Game Maker actually have a built-in blur? Effects blur, it does. Cool. Uh, if I were to just like give this a slight blur effect, uh, you would see that one. The black pixel is is almost gone. The black pixel is almost gone. Uh, that will still be there in the Sibyl filter. It might actually be a little bit bigger because the single black pixel was smudged into a number of uh, lighter gray ones. And the um, the second one, the light gray dot that I left is is virtually undetectable even if you zoom in. And now if I run the game, uh, you can see the outline around what was the black dot is still there, although it does indeed look a little bit more smudged. And the light gray one is um, is barely barely visible. Even with the uh, even with the shader that amplifies the uh, the contrast, and also the, uh, the the copyright line, the attribution line at the bottom here, has like a glow effect around it and a very thin line cut out through the middle of each of the letters, and that that looks cool in its own right. Okay, let me uh, let me undo this, undo both the blurring and um, and the little dots that I drew. So if you want to do this, uh, if you want to make this a little bit less sensitive. You can play with this number. Um, I have found that doing something like raising the result of this Pythagorean theorem square root to the second power, that needs to be a 2.0 or at least two dots to make it a flowing point instead of an integer. Um, I have found that if you raise this calculation to the second power and um, and square it, it will make the uh, the parts of the filter that are just barely barely visible a little bit more dark, so they won't be as um, they won't be as obnoxious. Uh, you can imagine the math if you have a number between 0 and 1 and you raise it to the second power. It's going to, if the if the value is 1, it'll stay the same, but if it's anything less than 1, it'll be reduced. That didn't really affect the cartoon rabbit since, again, very hard contrast. Uh, but it has cleaned up this a little bit. You can see the, um, you can see some of the weaker outlines have dimmed a little bit. And uh, this one is, this one is kind of still a mess. It's a little bit. Like the part, I think up here, this is like my sister's sock or something like that, or shoe or something. Uh, you can see this with uh, much less contrast than the grass does. Has um, has much less noise on it than it used to. You can see like the rabbit's nose has much less noise on it than it used to. As always, uh, shaders are really fancy math tricks that are being performed on every single pixel and every single vertex. Uh, play with these numbers and see what you come up with that you think looks best in your game. Um, hey. If you wanted to dim the outline a little bit, you could divide it by two... Oops, you can divide it by 2.0 instead. Divide it by, what, what number is that? You could divide it by 2.0 instead, and this would cause the outline to dim slightly. Um, again, this also this also serves to clean it up a little bit. You can see um, like the, the, the patches in the middle of the rabbit and in the middle of the grass aren't quite as loud as they used to be. This is, eh, just forget this image. This is not a good case. Um, I thought this was actually going to look better as a demo for the uh, for the outline because there is high contrast between the rabbit and all the other stuff around the rabbit, but uh, apparently not. It's the rabbit harness looks okay. The leash looks okay, for whatever that's worth. Maybe if you uh, maybe if you divide it by two point zero before raising to the second power, it would look better. You look the same. Eh, it's about the same. Okay. So this is the Sobel filter. Uh, this video took longer to record than I really thought it would. I've been going for an hour, 26 minutes. I'd like to cut that down to like 25. You can do a lot of stuff with this. You could render the outline instead of just to the regular application surface. You could render the outline to a secondary surface and then combine that with the application surface in something like the, uh, the draw GUI event or something. And you could combine the outline to the original image. I've been making Toon Shader videos lately. If you were to guess that that is going to be the subject of the next Toon Shader video, you would be correct. But that can wait for another day. I wanted to have that video up, uh, the next Toon Shader video, where I talk about outlines. I wanted to have that up by, by today as well, alongside this one. But um, looking at how much time I have, it's looking like that will not be happening, unfortunately. So uh, next week. Anyway, um, let's see, this is everything, right? If you want the code for this, link in the video description as always. Now you know how to create an outline shader. I hope you found that useful. If you want to contribute toward these videos being made, there is a Patreon link in all the usual places. I try to post about two of these videos a week. If you want more shader madness, uh, subscribe.
Otherwise, I hope you found that useful. You now know how to create a Sobel filter to, to detect outlines on an image, and I will see you all later. Special thanks to David Key, Edward Holt, Emily Coyo, Jason, and Zenith for supporting these videos. If you want to get access to these things a day early, or to see your name in the credits, head on over to the Patreon page in the video description to join the fun.